Happy Sabbath, everyone. The subject this morning is entitled Prepare for Betrayal. Prepare for Betrayal. Have you ever been betrayed by anyone? Someone who you trusted really cut you up. They did you no good. And you never expected it to come from them. Maybe others, but not them. Well, brothers and sisters, you are just getting started in learning how to deal with serious surprises. Because we have been warned over and over again by God that the saints are going to be betrayed even in these last days. People will look at you and smile at you and talk with you and act as though they are all on your favor in your behalf. But behind your back, they have a dagger waiting to slash you as soon as you turn around. And they may slash you more than once, unbeknown to you, in their exchanges with others, doing their best to try and belittle you or discredit you or hurt your character, and you may not know anything about it. Let me share with you the definition that Merriam-Webster gives for betrayal. The act of betraying someone or something or the fact of being betrayed. Violation of a person's trust or confidence of a moral standard, etc. In other words, what it's basically saying is someone seeking to destroy or hurt your character, your reputation, and maybe even your life. What we have to understand is the people who do the betraying are usually liars, pretenders, and destroyers. Sometimes it's out of envy, sometimes it's out of greed. Sometimes it's out of just hatred that you may not be able to explain where it came from, what caused it, especially if you know you tried to always be true to that person. Let's journey this for a second, because all of you sitting down here or are hearing my voice, at some point in time, if you've never been betrayed yet, you will be betrayed. And it's a hurtful thing because, as I said, it sometimes comes from where you least expect it. Open, let's open our Bibles to the book of Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. And we'll read verse 9 and 10. Matthew 24, verses 9 and 10. And this is Jesus speaking to his disciples. And it's not limited to his disciples in his day alone, as you will see as we read on, we are dealing with the end time prophecies. And his declaration is as follows. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. 
Not a very bright future, is it? At least not on this side of creation. The saints have to go through many things, brothers and sisters. Those who are really trying to serve God are going to have to go through a lot of things. Things that you never imagined you would have to go through, you and I are going to have to go through them. And we don't have to wait until we get right down to the time of trouble to start to experience it because the Lord wants to teach us how to deal with it. Because it's going to be on a larger scale as we advance forward in time. And Jesus is saying, they will not only betray you, but they will hate you. And you're going you're to see that usually there's a combination between the two. There's a certain amount of hate. Sometimes a person who is doing the betraying doesn't realize how much they may hate the person that they're betraying. But there are different motives or reasons why people do this. Let's go to chapter 6 of Matthew. Say Matthew, but this time chapter 26. Matthew 26, and look at verse 14 through 16. Matthew 26, 14 through 16. Then one of the twelve called Judas Iscariot went on to the chief priests and said unto them, what will, be, what will ye give me? And I will deliver him unto you. And they covenanted with him for thirty pieces of silver. And from that time he sought opportunity, I repeat, and from that time he sought opportunity to betray him. Premeditated. This was not a happenstance, this was not a mistake, this was a plan. And he worked that plan. And he worked that plan behind the scenes as best he could to betray the Son of God. Thinking that the Son of God didn't know what he was doing. But he worked the plan. What I find interesting is a number of things here. Judas knew that the priests didn't like Jesus or had a problem with Jesus. So he went to Jesus' enemies or he went to those who he knew would back him up. See, it does not necessarily mean that you're going to always go to the people who you no might have a problem with someone to tell them something about that someone. You might go to those who you know are friends with that someone in order to turn their minds against that someone. In this case, Judas was going to those who he knew would back him up. In other cases, you have to work your way into that person's friendship circle so that you can get close to them and then you can drop the negativity about their friend in order to win them over. It's a very devious set of steps that have to be taken in order to carry out the job. But when people look at the goal that they're pursuing, they don't care what it takes and how long it takes. They go all out to achieve their goal. John chapter 18, look at verse 1 through 5. John 18. And I want you to remember what, <laughs> what it was that Judas went and told the priest. How much will you give me if I hand him over to you? See, his, his motive was greed. Other people's motives may be ambition or maybe just for reasons of trying to replace or destroy that other person's credibility. As I said, John 18, and look at verse 1 through 5. 
When Jesus had spoken these words, he went forth with his disciples over the brook Cedron, where was a garden into which he entered and his disciples. And Judas also, which betrayed him, knew the place. For Jesus oftentimes resorted thither with his disciples. So he used his knowledge of his enemy to try and destroy his enemy. Judas then, having received a brand of men and officers, so he worked to make sure he had backup. Most of the time, people who have these ulterior motives or underhanded plans look for backup. Judas was no different. Having received a band of men and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, come at thither with lanterns and torches and weapons, because they usually have to work in the dark. In other words, behind the scenes. Verse 6, Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that should come upon him, went forth and said unto them, Whom seek ye? Now, I want you to look at Jesus' approach. Jesus didn't run and hide. He faced the enemy. He actually went forward to the enemy to greet the enemy. He knew they were coming for him this band of men, along with his close friend or disciple. He knew what they were coming for. And instead of running and hiding, Jesus went to them. And he said, Whom seek ye? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said unto them, I am he. And Judas also, which betrayed him, stood with them. He wasn't there to defend his Lord because he didn't regard him as his Lord at that point in time. He stood there with them to get Jesus. I want you to, um, to look at Jesus' actions, though. Jesus waited for the right time. And when the right time came, and he saw that the enemy was endeavoring to execute his plan, he went and met him. And said, who are you looking for? Oh, you're looking for Jesus? I'm him. Good shepherd. He was protecting his disciples. He was prepared to take the brunt because he knew in the long run righteousness always prevails. That's why you don't be afraid of your enemy if you know you're hidden in Christ. Like he knew he was hidden in his father. He had no reason to fear because who was in the worst position was the betrayer, unbeknown to the betrayer. Because he thought he could do everything fast forward and accomplish his goal, but not realizing that Jesus had full control over the situation because Jesus was in the favor of God. You've got to know you're in the favor of God. When you have enemies, you don't need to be afraid of them. You need to know you are in the favor of God. And rest assured, he'll take care of business. But you just have to prepare yourself for when he's ready for you to act like Jesus was ready to act at the right time. Because the disciples didn't know who they were dealing with. They saw Judas as a great asset to the discipleship. But Jesus knew from the very beginning that he would betray him. Many times we panic and feel as though we have to overreact 
And sometimes it may, it may be too soon. God's time is always the right time, brothers and sisters. You just need to make sure that you are walking with him. And he will take care of business. Greed made Judas do this. Greed. Not just did he see a lucrative future, but he also saw the possibility of more power. Because if his master could be forced to be exalted outside of the master's time, then he saw himself being able to be exalted too. What he did not calculate was that the master had the master plan. The master plan was that he was going to go through with the whole process and allow himself to be placed in an embarrassing situation so that in the end he could come out triumphant. He let them tie him, take him away, and even crucify him as far as they were permitted to. But he came out triumphant in the end. God has promised his people in these last days that there are certain things he will allow to happen to them and there are certain things he will not allow to happen to them but we have to follow the directions of God. Let's look again in the Bible. Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13. And this time we're looking at verse 13 and 14. Matthew chapter 13, the Word of God. Verse 13 and 14. Therefore speak I to them in parables, because they see and see not, and hearing they hear not. Neither do they understand, and in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which said, By hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see, and shall not perceive. Jesus often spoke in parables. He didn't always make things very clear. Because there were things he wanted the wise to understand and the foolish not to understand. But there were some things he made very clear. So clear that you, you are shocked. For example, when he was sitting with the disciples at the Last Supper, he came out point blankly and told them that one of them would betray him. That was as plain and as clear as crystal. This was not a parable. He was telling them that one of you would betray me. And they all started to inquire of him, Lord, is it I? Is it I? Including Judas. That's why I said people who do the betraying are usually liars. They're not afraid to lie. To achieve their goals. That's how you get to know of what spirit they're really of. And then you know to be very careful. Because once they start down that road, it is very difficult for them to turn around. Because the spirit of lies takes possession of the liar. That's why Jesus said, you are of the devil because your father was a liar from the beginning. So you need to listen to people. And when the Lord reveals to you that they are liars, you need to be careful and take heed. Because usually accompanied with liars are haters. So they may pretend that they have your best interests. But given the chance, they will destroy you if they are permitted. We are in for an experience in the future where Jesus said, your mother, your father, your brother, your sister 
shall give you up, so to speak. They will betray you. And you and I have to become aware of this possible evil taking place in our own personal lives, like Jesus was aware from the beginning. For that whole three and a half years, he knew that Judas was going to betray him. But he welcomed him into the fold to try and save him, to try and help him before it was too late. But Judas went beyond help. And that's why he went down the path that he did, even to the point that he ended up taking his own life under the control of the enemy that he had entertained for as long as he did. I want to share with you a statement from Spalding and Megan, page one and paragraph five, very much in harmony with the Bible. And that's why I say, you know, you use the Bible, make the foundation clear, enable others to see what the Word of God says so that anything else, it better harmonize. Note. Spalding and McGunn, and this is paragraph 5 of page 1. I saw the nominal church and nominal Adventists like Judas would betray us to the Catholics to obtain their influence to come against the truth. Did you hear that? Now, the word nominal means by name only. There are people who only serve God by name only. Call me a Christian. Isaiah brings that to our understanding in Isaiah chapter 4. He talks about seven women will take hold of one man, saying they don't want the food, they don't want the clothing, all they want is a name. Read it for yourself in Isaiah 4 just to be called by your name. So they may be Christians by name only. The rest of their life is a lie. Inspiration is telling us the church, the churches on a whole, along with even Adventists, some of them are going to just be by name only. And like Judas, they will betray the true saints to the Catholic Church. Note, the saints then will be an obscure people, little known to the Catholics. But the churches and nominal Adventists who know of our faith and customs, for they hated us on account of the Sabbath, for they could not refute it. How could you refute a teaching that the Bible is so clear about. The Bible is clear. Jesus himself declared his, that, that not one jot or one tittle from the law shall be fulfilled until, shall pass until all be fulfilled. Nothing will pass. Nothing will be erased. Nothing will be destroyed or removed or changed until all is fulfilled. And as I often like to quote Psalms 111, verse 7, in his commandments are sure, they stand fast forever and ever. Not for a short time, forever and ever. So we are told that certain churches, certain people are going to hate the saints because Notice, of their faith and customs, for they hated us on account of the Sabbath, for they could not refute it. And they will what? Will betray the saints and report them to the Catholics as those who disregard the institutions of the people, that is, that they keep the Sabbath and disregard Sunday. It's coming. That time is coming. A time of wide-scale betrayal. So the Lord will permit some betrayal even before that time 
in order to get us accustomed to the fact that the enemies, our enemies, will do whatever it takes to bring us down if they can. If they can. In the book Great Controversy, page 592 and paragraph 3, again, substantiating or even amplifying or helping us to better understand what the Word of God says that we are going to face, page 592 and paragraph 3. We just read in Matthew that even in these last days that many will betray us because they hate us. Hear what inspiration tells us. Great Controversy 592 and paragraph 3. The dignitaries of church and state will unite to bribe, persuade, or compel all classes to honor the Sunday. In other words, if they can't get you to just go along with it, they are prepared to pay you to go along with it. They'll bribe you. Now, if you have a love of money above a love of God or a love of the truth, and they offer you a million dollars to promote Sunday instead of Saturday, you know you will do it. Judas did it for only 30 pieces of silver. You think you won't? You will bribe, persuade, and even compel. So you don't want to do it voluntarily, then they're going to use force. And if you are one of those that is afraid to stand for the truth, you're going to buckle under their pressure. to keep Sunday instead of Saturday. Now remember, we're talking about the union of church and state. That is why Revelation 13 talks about a leopard-like beast. And it tells us that that leopard-like beast, which we know represents the papacy, will have an image. That image means it's going to be made up the same way as the beast itself. What made the papacy? Do you know what made the papacy the papacy? When the papacy united with the state to force the people to do their will. And that's what brought the Dark Ages from 538 to 1798, the union of church and state. Unfortunately, the legislators of this nation are in the process of encouraging the promoting of church and state unity. And any time, history teaches us that any time church and state united, they always ended up persecuting the people of God. It's historically. I did a whole sermon on it. It's one of my most favorite sermons because it tells you what is coming and how you can tell where you are. But this is what's going to happen. Church and state will unite. It will happen. It's not happen's chance. The Bible said it will happen because the Bible did say that there will be an image to the beast. That means another institution consisting of church and state united. And it will come up in the two-horned beast domain the United States of America. So regardless of who you vote for, you're not going to stop what is prophesied to happen. What is prophesied to happen is that there will be a union of church and state. And it will happen because the word of God is true and it always comes to pass. Inspiration gives us a little idea of how it is going to be dealt with. The lack of divine authority to prove that Sunday is the Sabbath. The lack of divine authority, because the Bible doesn't support it, will be supplied by oppressive enactments. In other words, they will pass laws. Laws that will promote that Sunday is the Sabbath 
And if you disobey, you're going to have to pay a certain amount of money to be released from punishment. Fines and imprisonment, we are told, is going to be dished out to the people of God. Are we ready? Let's read a little more. Political corruption is destroying love of justice and regard for truth. And even in free America, rulers and legislators, in order to secure public favor, in order to secure public favor, will yield to the popular demand for a law enforcing Sunday observance. You know, when people out there here, Seventh-day Adventists talking about this Sunday law, they think we are nuts. But you know, it is coming. Soon they're going to be hearing the religious world here in the United States of America, more than any other time before, urging upon the inhabitants of this nation that we need a day of rest. And it should be Sunday because that's the day that the Pope says is the new day of the Sabbath. And they have so much respect for the Pope. So much respect that they would follow what he says even if it cannot be supported by the Bible. And the public, listen carefully, the public are going to go along with it. And the legislators, we are told, are going to go along with it because they want to be in favor with the public. So you've got to understand ahead of time where the majority of the minds are going to go. It's going to go in support of it because if they tie it all together with COVID-19 and all the crime and stuff that has happened and will happen, when they tie it all together, they've already learned from the experiences of the year 2019 that fear will make the people in America and throughout the world Fear will make them do things that they never thought they would have done. It has been experimented on over the years in different countries under different circumstances how effective fear is to bring people into submission to the will of the authorities. And now it has come to America. And it is going to be used to the extreme, especially when they begin, and they've already started. I've read articles where individuals have been showing as a result of COVID-19 and the guidelines and the restrictions that have been implemented. We've been able to save the planet to some extent. We have better environmental circumstances because less people were working. That's already being touted. It's already being promoted. We save the environment by having people stay at home, so we might as well implement a national day of rest so that we can save the planet by everybody staying away from their jobs and just going and worshiping God. And of course, the day that will be chosen will be Sunday. I'm going to read over the middle of it. And in free America, rulers and legislators, in order to secure public favor and yield to the popular demand for a law enforcing Sunday observance. That's where we are heading. And listen to the last part of the reference, which to me is really mind-blowing. Liberty of conscience, which has cost so great a sacrifice, will no longer be respected. Mob rule 
If the majority says that this is what we need, you need to just fall in line and go with the majority. That's called solidarity, mind you. To save the planet. We are heading down the path, brothers and sisters. And we are told that the final movements will be rapid ones. So what is going to make that switch, time will tell. But what we do know is, when it is made, it is the saints that will be the targets. Another reference I want to share is found in volume three of the Testimonies, page 280 and paragraph three. Volume three of the Testimonies, 280 and paragraph three. If God abhors or hates one sin above another, of which his people are guilty, it is doing nothing in case of an emergency. So here it is, you see people doing evil, speaking evil, acting evil, and you do nothing about it. Oh, let the evil fulfill its purpose. You're not going to stop the evil if you see evil coming? Even inside of the church, if you see, if you see, if you see someone run into the church with a gun, what are you going to do, run and hide behind one of the kids? Who are you going to use as your shield? People are afraid to expose evil. That's the world we live in. And one sin above another, of which his people are guilty. One sin above all other that God hates. It is doing nothing in case of an emergency. You see the evil festering and you feed it even by your silence. Note, indifference and neutrality in a religious crisis is regarded of God as a grievous crime and equal to the very worst type of hostility against God. Why did Jesus step up? He was protecting the sheep. Are you going to protect God's sheep? Or are you going to feed the enemy until the enemy gets fat and strong enough to harm everyone in their path? Judas could have hurt everybody. He could have got the soldiers to hurt all the disciples. Jesus stepped up and said, I am he. I am he. He covered the bases, made sure that it was clear that the sheep need to be protected. We like to be neutral. You know that? That's why inspiration says that God's people are guilty of it. They know evil is in the making and they keep their mouth shut. They see it. The Spirit of God tells them this is wrong and they say nothing. Let it grow. Let it fester. And whatever harm it causes, not my fault, and yet in the sight of God, it's a grievous crime. Indifference, as though, well, no big deal. It's not me. I'm not the, I'm not the victim here. I, I'm just listening. Indifference and neutrality. I am on no side. I'm, I'm in the middle. Huh? You in the middle? There's no middle ground for the saints. It's either you're on the Lord's side or you're on the enemy's side. No middle ground. And we need to get that clear because if we don't practice it now, when the crisis comes, we're going to try to be neutral. 
and the Lord considers it a grievous crime. You think you could get the seal of God with that? Equal to the very worst hostility. In other words, you could not have been more hostile by your indifference, neutrality, and silence. You couldn't commit a worse crime in the sight of God because you leave the sheep. Open game for the wolves. We've got to learn, brothers and sisters, that we have a responsibility to guard the flock, not just the shepherd. Jesus made sure that he taught us by his own example that he wouldn't have it. You take me. Who are you looking for? Jesus the Christ? I'm he. He stepped up to the plate. What about you? He's our example. Are you going to follow Christ? Example. Because it's coming. If it's not here already, it's coming. Every single one of us are going to find ourselves victims of betrayal because the Bible says that that is going to be the case. You're going to be betrayed by mother, father, brother, sister, friend, and even strangers. Education 57, page 57 and paragraph 3. Now, all of these are just to really give you a clear picture of what the Bible said and where we are supposed to stand. And I'm going to show you some Bible references in a second, but let's read what we have been told. The greatest want of the world is the want of men. And men here means both men and women, human beings. Men who will not be bought or sold. In other words, they will not take bribe. They won't, do, they, they, won't, they won't go along with the evil just because they want you to be their friend. Will not be bought or sold. Men who in their inmost souls are true and honest. Men who do not fear to call sin by its right name. Men whose conscience is as true to duty as the needle to the pole. Men who will stand for the right, though the heavens fall. Are you one of those men or women that you're not afraid that people are going to hate you because you stand up for what you know is right? That you're not afraid to address the evil that you hear or see because you know it is evil. Not afraid. Not afraid that people will mention your name in the process of unraveling the enemy's plots. Not afraid that your name is called. I, I often hear people say, well, I don't want my name to be called in that. So don't, 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 don't say I said it. Huh. The day is coming when we will prove whether or not we are made of solid Holy Spirit metal or we are just a bundle of straw. We need men, we really do, I can tell you that, who are true to duty as the needle to the pole. If you put a needle next to a pole, you're going to see they stand erect. They don't move. They are upright all the time. That's the kind of men and women the Lord is looking for. Those who will be upright all the time. Even when nobody else is watching, they're standing for the right. They're not trying to play games with people and try to make sure that, you know, I don't, I don't want them to think I don't agree with them. You know, I'm going to just keep my mouth shut. 
and listen to what they have to say, even though I know what they're saying isn't right. It is time for God's people to become like Christ. It is time for God's people to learn to be like the needle and the pole, to see truth through the eyes of God and through the example of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Because when the Sabbath truth is challenged, you will not stand for it if you see you threaten to lose a friend. If you're not afraid to lose a friend now because you have to correct them when you see they speak or they act incorrectly or inappropriately, if you're, if you're afraid to say, no, I don't, I, I don't want to hear that. You go and talk to that person instead. Don't tell me that. If you're afraid, you're going to be afraid to stand up for the truth in the future as well. You know why? You're developing a habit of swimming and compromising on the pressure. What does your conscience tell you? When you know what you know, what does your conscience tell you? That how oh, it's okay, God does not mind? Let there be division, let there be harm. What does your conscience tell you? Inspiration says, men whose conscience is as true to duty as the needle to the pole. Is that your conscience? Are you comfortable with your conscience speaking to you and saying, you know you should not have done that? And then you react appropriately. You make amends. You show God that you genuinely repent. Or do you just indifference? or neutrality is your course of action. Brethren, the day is coming when you will betray your own brothers and sisters for maybe less than 30 pieces of silver when you realize that your life might be at stake. You will do it. I always remember a story I read in, I believe it was the, the Fox's Book of Martyrs, where this particular teacher had a class of young students, and they loved him. He was teaching them very clearly a lot of information concerning the truths of God and the life of the saints over the years, those who stood for the Lord, and preparing them for the difficult times that the church was going to face. And when the trouble came, those very students took the authorities who were looking for the teacher, because they knew that this teacher was promoting the truth. These very students went and led this teacher out and handed him over to the authorities. His very students. You want to talk about betrayal? It's easy to happen when fear takes a hold of you. Easy to happen. God's people have to learn how to overcome fear and allow the faith in God to take control of them or else that spirit of the Lord could depart from them. They need to learn how to keep it lest they lose it. The Bible makes it clear, Revelation, let's go to the Bible again, brothers and sisters. Revelation chapter 14, and let's read verse 5. Revelation chapter 14. And verse 5. Speaking about the 144,000, the Word of God declares, And in their mouth was found no guile for they are without fault before the throne of God. The 144,000 don't have any guile in their mouths. There's no error, there's no lie. You, don't, you wouldn't be confused as to where you stand with them. 
They are not pretenders, they are not liars, and they are not destroyers. So they do not betray each other. They all love the truth and they stand for the truth, the pure, unadulterated truth. And they have learned to rest their souls upon the Lamb. That's why they stand on Zion with the Lamb. Because all along they were in close connection with each other. All along the way, they became true friends. They knew when they needed strength to do the right thing, even though the right thing was hard to do. They knew where they could get the strength from to do it. They became close to the master, every single one of them. And there will never be a hypocritical word nor a destroying word against a brother or a sister coming out of their mouths. No guile. No guile in their mouths. So when you are approached in the future, even in regards to others, you need to know how to speak. And if you have been approached in the past, you need to know to let these people know Go somewhere else, don't come to me. Because the day is coming when the saints are going to be hunted down and some are going to be approached with bribe, persuasion, and even force to betray their own brothers and sisters. And they will do it if they have not practiced depending on the Lamb, to show them how to do the right thing before that time came. No guile will be in the mouths of any member of the 144,000, and that is why they will receive the seal of God. No pretense, no hypocrisy. Let's go to the book of Psalms as I begin to wrap this up. Psalms 57, and look at verse 1 to 3. Psalm 57. And these are very interesting words of assurance from the Word of God. Psalm 57, 1 to 3. Listen to this prayer of the psalmist David. Be merciful unto me, O God. Be merciful unto me. For my soul trusted in thee. Yea, in the shadow of thy wings will I make my refuge until these calamities be overpassed. Now, he learned through his tough experiences where his refuge lies. You need strength. You need wisdom. You need help. Go to the Lord. He'll tell you how to deal with any and every situation, but you go to the Lord. Don't just be indifferent and try to take a neutral position. It's either you with the Lord and for the Lord or you're against him. One or the other. There's no middle ground. This is a battle between good and evil. It's not a battle where you can stand in the middle. It is between good and evil and you have to be on one side or the other. Verse 2 says, I will cry unto God most high, unto God that performeth all things for me. He shall send from heaven and save me from the reproach of him that would swallow me up. Do you believe that? Do you believe that the Lord will protect his people? Sometimes he uses others to help to protect them, though. That's why he has created shepherds and under shepherds. That's why he has created parents to take care of the children. That's why he creates guardians, because he uses others. That's why he uses angels, because he gives everybody an opportunity to show what they are made of. And he puts us in situations where we will prove whether we are truly spiritually mature or not. But we try to shy away and run away from it instead of standing firm and strong like a needle to a pole. 
I want to read a few more verses before I close. I want to read a few more verses right here in Psalm 57. I want you to see what this brother was dealing with. He said, my soul, reading from verse 4, my soul is among lions, and I, lie, and I lie even among them that are set on fire, even the sons of men. So he's talking about human beings, brothers and sisters, and he's referring to them as lions. I guess they wanted to eat him up, and he discovered that. Even the sons of men whose teeth are spears and arrows, and their tongue a sharp sword. My, oh, my. Be thou exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let thy glory be above all the earth. They have prepared a net for my steps. My soul is bowed down. They have digged a pit before me into the midst whereof they have fallen themselves. Let us get to know God, brothers and sisters. Let us get to know God. Let us be able to prove from day to day in our dealings with him and in our dealings with our fellow men that when the time of trouble comes, we are going to be molded and shaped and fashioned. We will be ready to truly be God's representatives. Because if we don't believe that we need to prepare for betrayal, when it does come, when it does happen to us, we will be devastated. But if you know in advance that it will come, when it does come, like Christ, you'll be ready for it. Because then you'll be able to pass the test in whatever form or fashion the enemy may be allowed to bring it. Do away with your fear. Christ is all-powerful. Do away with your fear. We have to stop being cowards. Do away with your fear. How could you be a good shepherd if you are afraid of the wolf? You know, many times the Lord tested David in the Bible, even when he was a young man, before he gave him the crown. Before he allowed David to sit on the throne, you know how many times David was tested? He was taking care of the sheep. And a lion came against the sheep. And as a young man, he didn't back down. It was a test. God was looking to see, what would you do if I placed others within your care? He didn't back down. One after the other, the Lord permitted these wild animals to come after him, both human and symbolical. He allowed it. Why? To toughen him up, to prepare him for what he had to face. And we too, brothers and sisters, need to allow the Lord to have his way with us and prepare us for what we are about to face. And don't squirm under the test. You need to be strong, and you need to know where your strength lies. And you need to in, determine within yourself you're not going to be indifferent or neutral at all. You're going to take a stand. You're going to put your foot down on what you know is right from what is wrong, instead of trying to squirm your way out of it so that you don't have to make your position known. That's cowardice. The Lord is in need of people who, when the Sunday law becomes an issue, they're not going to be afraid to tell others, I believe in the seven-day Sabbath. We need to be able to do that when the time comes, because we will help to open the eyes of others who may have been uncertain as to what, what position they should take. 
But if we are afraid, if we believe in just living a life of compromise now, if we are afraid, I'm afraid that we are going to be in a very sad situation because we will not have the backbone to do the right thing when other lives are going to be at stake because of our decision. May God help us to prepare for betrayal.